everybody in this video we will go over the polymerase chain reaction and you know I hesitate to cover this because you know there are thousands probably thousands of tutorials online uh, interactive tutorials that can give you a really good idea of how PCR works and I know here at ISU we cover this in BSC 197 and I know many of you have probably even covered it in high school because it's such an important technique uh, in you know genetics but but biology as a whole uh, PCR is really important but uh, you know I want I want to have a series of videos that cover all the important topics of genetics so I will do uh, a brief introduction into the polymerase chain reaction and, and uh, essentially if you watch this video well you should understand conceptually how the polymerase chain reaction works and why we need certain temperatures and and things like that uh, so essentially the polymerase chain reaction was invented I, th I think in the 1990s um, no 80s sorry 1980s 80s and what you can do is you can use it to make millions of identical, assuming no errors, right? Identical copies of a DNA molecule. And, you know, the size range can be, can't be like a, a million base pairs long, but from 50 base pairs to about 10,000 base pairs is, you know, pretty standard for a typical PCR reaction. So any any DNA molecule in this size range, 50 base pairs to 10,000 base pairs, can reliably be amplified and copied. Um, and, and you can make many copies of it with PCR. And often you need to do that to determine the genotype of something or determine the sequence of a DNA molecule. You first need to make many copies of it. And also it's, it's usually one of the first steps to genetically engineering an organism. You know, you want to take one gene from one organism, put it into another, a different organism. What you need to do is make many copies of that gene first as the first step to, to being able to make that genetically modified organism. So there are six components needed to perform a PCR reaction. And some might say seven. It depends on if you count uh, one of the components, which I'm going to call a primers, as one or two. So I'm going to count primers as one component. So one component. You need primers. So you need a forward primer and a reverse primer. I'll talk more about what these are in a second, but you can probably guess from our discussions uh, throughout the semester that DNA polymerase needs a primer in order to, to synthesize DNA. And that's what these are going to be for. The DNA polymerase used in PCR is going to need a primer. And so let's go with number two, DNA polymerase. And this is a special polymerase that works high, well at high temperatures. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So we need DNTPs. In the last video, we talked about DDNTPs. But no, for this, we just need deoxyribonucleic acids. So DATP, DTTP, DG, TP and DCTP. So the D is for deoxy, right? Because we need DNA nucleotides, not RNA nucleotides. We need buffer because the DNA polymerase doesn't like working in water alone. It needs some salts in order to work effectively. We need water and we need the DNA to be copied. We're going to call that the DNA template. So in the reaction, you know, scientists have worked out the optimum concentrations of all of these things already. So for the DNA template, you need at least one, at least one copy of that to start with. But usually you're probably going to start with thousands of copies. And then ideally you're going to turn those thousands into millions of copies. In the buffer, there's a certain concentration for that. For these, you're probably going to have hundreds of millions of each of these in the reaction. DNA polymerase, let's say it's probably going to be thousands of, of these polymerase molecules of these proteins, the enzymes. 
uh, in one reaction. In the forward and reverse primers, uh, probably probably 100 million of each of these. Or maybe more, I haven't actually worked out the, the concentrations for this, but I just want you to, to know it's not like you just have one primer molecule in one molecule of the reverse primer. You've got millions of these things in the reaction. But the DNA template is found in low numbers, and the, the goal is to make many, many copies of, of the template or at least a part of the template, the part you want to copy. And we're gonna do all of this in a PCR tube. And these are these small, and you can check the notes, I have a picture of one, tiny tubes. They hold about 200 microliters, so 0.2 milliliters of uh, liquid. And down here in this liquid, we have our water and buffer. That's where we'll have all of our primers and our template and everything. And the reaction is going to take place inside this little tube that we will put into a PCR machine. And you know, if you took 197, I'm pretty sure you've actually done PCR before, but you don't do PCR every day as a student. And I'm sure you forgot all the details. So we'll cover it here to make sure you are prepared for the exam um, and quizzes in this course. So. Now for the DNA template, let's say we want to copy this piece of DNA right here. Now it is, you know, it's really short here and I'm just diagramming a small molecule so you can understand conceptually how PCR works. So now let's say this is the DNA we want to copy, so this is the template, and it's also our target molecule. We want to copy this whole thing. Sometimes you can copy just little pieces, right? If you have a whole genome as the template, you only want to copy one gene. Well, well, yeah, you only want to copy part of it, but for this example, let's say we want to copy this whole thing here. First step is to get this into our PCR tube, right? This is in the PCR reaction. What we're going to do is we're going to heat that reaction to 95 at least 95 degrees Celsius. And this is called the denaturation step. And you can probably guess what's going to happen to the DNA template at this temperature. Uh, you can probably guess from, from what we've learned this semester, right? At this high temperature near boiling, all the hydrogen bonds holding these strands together are going to break. And those DNA strands are going to come apart so DNA denaturation is separating the single strands or uh, uh, breaking the hydrogen bonds between the strands to make single stranded molecules. So there's one single strand here and there's another one here and these separate and they float through the solution. And they have five prime and three prime ends so those won't change. Made the backbone a little too long there. Okay, so we've denatured all the copies of the template and they're floating in the, the liquid here. Now also in there, remember we added the primers. Now for this example, I'm going to assume the primers are three nucleotides long. Now that's way, way too short. That's way too short to, to work well as a primer. Usually primers should be um, at least 20 nucleotides long. And they could be as long as, uh, maybe as short as 18, and as long as like 50 nucleotides. But three, three is gonna be way too short. But again, I just want to introduce you to the uh, how PCR works conceptually. And the primers, so what they are is oligonucleotides. Oligonucleotides, if you remember from a one of the previous videos, uh, they're single-stranded uh, DNA or RNA molecules, and they have five prime and three prime ends, right? And in this case, we're going to use three, three uh, nucleotide long oligonucleotides. So here's one. Uh, this is going to be the forward primer. You understand why I call it forward in a second. We're gonna have many copies floating around in this reaction mix here. And the reverse primer is going to be like this, AAA. 
and we've got many copies of this reverse primer floating in the reaction mix here. And I'm putting these arrows here to show the directionality of the DNA molecule. Okay, now the forward primer, well, you know what? It's still at 95 degrees Celsius. So what we need to do next is we need to lower the temperature. And we're gonna start with a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. And we're gonna call this step the annealing step. And what's annealing? Well, the primers are going to anneal to the template. And there's so many primers relative to the strands of template that that's very unlikely for these strands to find each other and, and pair again and anneal or hybridize to each other before a primer is to find these. And so what's gonna happen during this annealing step is the primers are gonna to stick to the template. So this primer GTA is gonna stick right here. So see how it's complementary? So let me put that down here. C-A-T-G-G-G-G-G-A-A-A. -A -A -A. So five prime, three prime. Uh, okay, so this one of the primer, one primer molecule is gonna stick here by complementary base pairing. And there's a three prime OH at the end of this A nucleotide here. And the polymerase could, you know, theoretically it could, it could latch on here and start elongating this primer. But it's not going to because the, the polymerase doesn't work well at this temperature. But let me show binding of the reverse primer to this strand first before we go on to the next step. So G, T, A, C, 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 T, 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 um, A, A, A. Okay, so now we have our primers stuck to the single-stranded templates that were single-stranded, you know, that we made single-stranded by denaturation. We lower the temperature, and now the primers can stick. Okay, so in the next step, what we have is uh, the extension step. So we raise the temperature of the reaction to 72 degrees Celsius. And you know what likes that temperature? The polymerase likes that temperature. So instead of me diagramming this whole thing again on a new page, what I'll do is I'll fold this guy like this. Okay, so we raised the temperature to 72 degrees. And what happens is, okay, now polymerase can come on here and it can extend these three prime ends. G, 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 T, A, C. And if it gets to the end, there's no more template, the polymerase can fall off. And look, we have a full copy here, another copy of that DNA molecule. Same thing, it can extend this one, five prime to three prime direction. C, 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 T, T, T. Okay, we've got another copy of that of the DNA molecule. So we started with one, we denatured the strands, we annealed the primers, we extended the primers, and now we have two copies of that DNA molecule. Okay, so what's gonna happen next? Well, we're gonna do many cycles of that. Many cycles of uh, denaturation at 95 degrees annealing at 60 degrees and extending at 72 degrees. So what's gonna happen? Okay, let's say before the PCR started, we had one template right here. And we wanted to make many, many copies of this. Okay, so denature at 95, anneal at 60, extend at 72. And then what we get? Two copies. Now we repeat the process. So just raise the temperature of the solution to 95 degrees again. So the strands separate. Anneal primers again, right? We've got million, hundreds of millions of copies of those primers in, in the tube. So they're gonna stick to the single-stranded templates, then extend at 72. And what we end up with is four copies. So we're doubling the number of copies of the target DNA with each 
cycle of 95, 60, and 72 degrees. So here, this is zero cycles, right? This is after one cycle, and this is after two cycles. And we have a formula that we can use to calculate the number of molecules we can have after a certain number of cycles, assuming we start with one copy of the DNA target. So and that formula is 2 to the n, where n is the number of cycles. n equals number of cycles. Okay, so here we have n equals, uh, let's say, 0, 1, 2, and then let's go to 25 down here. So 25 is a typical number of times you would, you would uh, number of cycles you would, I guess, run a PCR uh, reaction through. So let's say number of copies of the DNA. So at zero, if we plug two to the zero equals one, so that's just how exponents work. Now that makes sense, right? One copy at zero cycles, okay. How about two to the one? Well, it turns out that's gonna be two. And okay, after one cycle, yep, we have two. How about two to the raised to the second power? Well, that should be four. So let's see, one, two, three, four. Okay, so if we get a calculator, and we do two raised to the 25, 25th power, we should get 33,554,000 uh, copies of this DNA molecule. Okay, so you can see how it's really easy to use PCR to make many, many, many copies of a DNA molecule. And once you have this many copies, well, you can do a lot of things like that. Like I said, it's the first step to making a transgenic organism, putting a new gene in a, a gene from one species in a, in a, a different organism, or determining the, determining the sequence of a molecule, um, and genotyping an organism. So all that will uh, require PCR. So, okay, so let's go into some important details of the process. So just a, just a little extra, little bit more information so we can make sure you, you um, I can ask you some interesting questions on exams and quizzes with respect to PCR to make sure you really understand the process. So first thing I want to talk about in a little more detail are the first thing is uh, or involves the primers. So in the example, you know, there were only three nucleotides long, but primers should be oligonucleotides of, let's say, 18 to at least 18 to 22 nucleotides long. That's pretty standard right there. And they can be much longer, but this is, this is a good size. Any shorter than that, and then the primer will match too many regions of the genome. Um, and you, you won't be able to amplify your target. You'll amplify lots of different pieces of DNA. And I'm going to explain more about that in a second. So it's also important for the primers to bind, uh, bind to the very ends of the target sequence. So you have to design your primers and choose the sequence of the primers so they stick to either side of the target sequence. So let me see if I can find, remember in our theoretical example here, I wanted to copy this whole thing. So our primers needed to bind, you know, here and here. You know, if they, if, they, if, they, if they didn't bind here, bound in here, well then I wouldn't copy the whole thing. I would copy just, just this part over here. So they need to bind to the very end of the target, on either side of the target. So one more thing about primers, but first we need to talk about the steps of PCR. So the steps are sort of defined by, um, okay, three things, right? First step is denaturation. And they're sort of defined by the temperatures we're using. So 95 degrees Celsius is the standard temperature for denaturation, for the a denaturation step. For annealing, now a pretty standard is 60 degrees Celsius. And for the extension step, 
pretty standard is 72 degrees Celsius. Now, in a genetics course, you know, when we're learning about PCR, you know, and especially a course without a lab component, like our course here at ISU, and if you're interested in the lab component for genetics, make sure you take BSC 220, BSC 353, or BSC 354. So these are, are where our labs for our courses in genetics and cell biology, they've all gone into these separate courses. So with respect to these steps right here, uh, so what we want to do is kind of have a conceptual understanding of what these temperatures are and why these are being used. So what we could probably predict for denaturation, 95 degrees, well, 95 degrees needs to be used because we need a very high temperature, high enough to break those hydrogen bonds. And as we have talked about earlier in the course, so if we want to separate separate DNA strands, you know, all we need to do is, is uh, get the temperature of the, the solution containing the DNA near 100 degrees. It turns out we don't need 100 degrees exactly. 95 is, is, is usually high enough to separate the strands of uh, DNA. So that's why we're using 95 degrees. Now 72 degrees, well it turns out the polymerase that is used for PCR works best at 72 degrees Celsius. So that's why we use this temperature here. That's the, the temperature the enzyme is most, uh, the temperature the enzyme works most efficiently at. Now this one right here, this is chosen as the temperature to promote annealing of the primer to the target sequence. And the temperature changes, you know, often changes from one reaction to another. And the temperature is chosen so that it is, a rule of thumb is the temperature should be five degrees Celsius below the TM or the, the TM of the primer, forward or reverse, with the lowest TM. Okay, what is TM? Do you remember? So TM is melting temperature. So this, this comes back again and again. Uh, the melting temperature of a DNA molecule comes back again and again throughout uh, genetics courses, and especially in this course. So we want to choose an annealing temperature that, that is five degrees below the melting temperature or predicted melting temperature of the primer with the lowest TM. Okay, so, so why? What does that matter? So now we know what melting temperature is. Maybe you remember. So the melting temperature of a DNA molecule is the temperature at which 50% of the molecule is double-stranded. and 50% of the molecule is single-stranded. And at the melting temperature, the, the molecule should go be at an equilibrium where some molecules that are double-stranded are becoming single-stranded and some that are single-stranded are becoming double-stranded. Now, it's a little weird with a primer, right? Because when, you, when we have a primer, primers are only single-stranded. You know, when you order primers from a biotechnology company to do your PCR reaction, you don't order both strands, you just order one strand. So with respect to a primer, the melting temperature is sort of the, the it's the predicted temperature at which half of the molecules would be bound to the template, the target sequence, and the other half would not be bound. And you have to assume there that the ratio of, of primer to template is one to one. So the TM is sort of a prediction that we make for our primers. And there are lots of programs that can predict what the TM is for any primer sequence. But I'm going to show you a method that you can use to, to predict the melting temperature um, by with a, I guess, in your head um, with a paper with paper and pencil. Uh, okay, so now let's assume that we have a forward primer with a TM of 68 degrees Celsius. And we have a reverse primer with a TM of 65 degrees Celsius. And so the annealing temperature you would choose for this PCR reaction 
should be 60 degrees Celsius because it's five degrees below the TM of the primer with the lowest melting temperature. So that's how one would choose the annealing temperature. And why, why is this important? Why is, I mean, why not just choose, you know, 30 degrees, like a really low annealing temperature? And maybe I can explain that with this diagram here. So let's assume this, assume this is a long piece of DNA that we're trying to amplify by PCR. We're trying to copy by PCR. And we've already denatured it. And we're just showing you here, say, the forward primer, which is supposed to bind here. And this is where it matches. This is where the complementary base pairing between these is perfect, between the target here, the template, in the forward primer. So we want the primer to bind here. And if we choose a high enough annealing temperature, close enough to the TM, then most of the primer in, in, the, in the solution will bind here. But if we were to go really low, to like 30 degrees or something like that, so room temperature, then that would encourage the primer to misprime you know, to bind to other locations, even though the complementary base pairing isn't perfect. If we use a really low temperature, it doesn't matter. It'll stick to the wrong locations. And then what we'll end up doing is copying the wrong DNA. Now, we don't want to copy these little parts in here. We want to copy this whole thing. So choosing that annealing temperature that is that is low enough to get allow your primer to anneal to the template, but not so low that it's going to anneal to, to the wrong location is one of the important aspects of performing a polymerase chain reaction. Uh, let me expand upon that a little bit so I can show you uh, how we could get mis mispriming if we choose too low of a temperature. So here is a sequence of DNA. Um, now here is our primer. Let's say we want our forward primer to bind starting here. Now this is going to be perfectly complementary. And this is the uh, how we want our primer to bind to this DNA molecule here. And OK, so we're going to copy this piece in here, and it's going that way. And this is a perfect interaction between a primer and a template. Now, let's say somewhere else in that template, or maybe even another on another chromosome or something, say we're trying to amplify something from genomic DNA, and you know the whole, the, uh, you know, we have genomic DNA isolated from 100 cells from a human, so we've got lots of different sequences in here. But let's say there's a somewhat similar sequence to this. This is the sequence we want our primer to bind to. But let's say at another location in the genome, there's a somewhat similar sequence. So let's say, oh, I didn't want to start with the same thing because uh, it's just this part that's similar. So let's see something like this. Now, okay, the primer, you know, if we choose an annealing temperature that's too low, okay, well, this primer right here kind of matches this a little bit, right? This G can go here, well, the C won't fit, but the G matches, the A doesn't match, this G matches, the C matches, this A does not, this G does, the C does, A does not, G does, C does, T does, this G doesn't, this A doesn't. Um, let me see here. Well, I want this last one to match, and there are reasons why if you are, you want the last one to match. So, okay. So we can see how, you know, just a little bit of chance complementarity between this primer and this part, this template down here, can allow this primer to stick at low annealing temperatures. And thus we end up copying 
the wrong piece of DNA in our PCR reaction. So that's why choosing the annealing temperature high enough that, that these this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, these, these 11 bases of the primer, even though they match the template at 11 positions, by choosing a uh, high enough temperature, these 11 uh, place uh, or uh, positions of interaction will not be sufficient enough to allow this to stick to prime uh, DNA synthesis. So we want it high enough that, that this primer cannot stick to this location by partial complementarity. Okay, so Well, we have programs that can estimate the melting temperature of a single-stranded DNA primer, um, but we can estimate them uh, just with this formula here. So uh, estimate TM for an oligonucleotide primer of, let's say, 20 to 22 nucleotides in length. Now, it doesn't work. This formula won't give you a good estimate for uh, oligonucleotides that are much longer than this. But it works pretty well for uh, oligonucleotides for primers that are about this length. And, and it usually matches what a uh, uh, algorithm from a biotechnology can give you or can predict for an oligonucleotide for you. So essentially what you do is you count up the numbers of G's and C's in the molecule and you multiply that number by four and then you count up the number of A's and T's in the molecule and you multiply that by two. Okay, well, let's do an example here. Let's say this is a primer and this is a sequence of, this is kind of what you would expect to, to, for a primer to look like um, for a sequence. I think it's about 22 nucleotides long, and we can count up the A's and T's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So 11 A's and T's. So it's going to be 11 times two. And then there should be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven G's and C's. So we're going to multiply that by four. We're going to get 44 there. We're going to add those together, and we have an annealing, oh, a melting temperature for that primer of 66 degrees Celsius. And if this was the lowest, if the other primer had a higher melting temperature or the same melting temperature, the annealing temperature for our PCR reaction would be 61 degrees Celsius. Okay, and this temperature gives us the best chance of amplifying the correct sequence, of copying the correct sequence in our PCR reaction. So, a couple more things. You would perform a PCR uh, reaction or a PCR assay in a PCR machine, also known as a thermal cycler. Essentially, what this is a machine, it's going to look something like this. It's pretty small, probably smaller than a microwave, a standard microwave. And what they do is you, you put your little PCR tubes in there. And what these machines do is they control the temperature. They're really good at, at heating the, these tubes, little tubes, to specific temperatures really fast. It is really fast. So let's say our temperatures are 95 degrees for step one, denaturation, 60 degrees for annealing, 72 degrees for extension. Let's say we want to do this 25 times. And what we do, we just program this into the, into the thermal cycler here. We say we want 95 degrees and, and a typical length of time for each step is going to be 10 seconds. It only takes like 10 seconds to denature all the DNA. And then the annealing, usually only 15 seconds. It's only 15 seconds for those primers to find the template and bind to the correct spot. And then the extension step, 72 degrees, well, we want that to be about one minute per 1,000 base pairs of sequence that we want to copy. So let's say the target DNA we're trying to make copies of is 1,000 base pairs long. Well, then we'd want our extension time 
for the at 72 degrees Celsius, we want this to be one minute. If it's 2,000 base pairs long, well, we'd want this to be two minutes. We want to give that polymerase long enough to, to synthesize the DNA. We want to give the polymerase a sufficient amount of time to copy the DNA. Okay, and then the thermal cycler will just change the temperature, you know, from 95 to 60 to 72 degrees 25 times. And at the end, we should have millions of copies of that DNA molecule. Last thing here, notice these temperatures. Well, those are pretty high, right? The human body, so human cells are what? 37 degrees Celsius? Close to 37 degrees Celsius? So you can bet our DNA polymerase works, or our DNA polymerases, we have a couple different polymerases. Eukaryotes have a couple different polymerases, DNA polymerases. So they work well at 37 degrees Celsius. If we try to use our DNA polymerase at 72 degrees Celsius, well, the DNA polymerase would probably denature. When you talk about proteins denaturing, that just means their structure comes apart. They won't function. So in order for PCR to work, what scientists had to discover first was that enzymes from geothermal organisms work really well at high temperatures. They work really well at high temperatures. And so the first enzyme used for the polymerase chain reaction came from an organism called Thermus aquaticus. And this is an organism, a, a microorganism that grows well near geysers. So uh, in geothermal soil, so, so very, very hot conditions. So all of its enzymes and proteins are all, have evolved to withstand these high temperatures. And as a result, we can do PCR because these high temperatures are needed for, you know, denaturation and high enough, the high enough annealing temperature so the primer can anneal to the correct location on the target sequence. If we had to use much lower sequences, then it would just be a mess. It, it wouldn't work out. And we can use such high temperatures because scientists discovered that these organisms have enzymes that can work at high temperatures. And we happen to use a DNA polymerase from organisms uh, that grow well in geothermal soils. We use the, their enzymes in PCR. So if you should ever want to invent something uh, that you know requires an enzyme that is stable at high temperatures, well, this is where you should look. Geothermal organisms, just use their, just use their enzymes for, for your invention. Okay, so that's it for PCR. There are some problems on PCR. I believe I covered everything you need to do those problems in the video. Um, but take a look at the problems. The answers are on ReggieNet. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, see you in the next video where we will talk about Sanger sequencing.